On March 15, 2013, the Buffalo History Museum, in collaboration with the Buffalo Broadcasters Association, hosted the Giants of Buffalo radio event. An eager crowd comprised of broadcast veterans and fans gathered at the Buffalo History Museum for a night of reflections and insight from some of Buffalo's radio legends. Now, let us take you to the museum's auditorium and the host for the evening, WBBZ-TV's John DeShillo. And I, I do want to thank not only the Buffalo Broadcasters, Heidi Raphael, uh, but also want to thank uh, Melissa Brown and uh, Tara Lyons, Connie Caldwell, of course, who's on our Offbeat Cinema show and also works here at the, historical, uh, the uh, History Museum. Thank you. And your total team here at the Buffalo History Museum has done a great job. Now, even though our giants are very well known, we thought what we would do is introduce each one of them, okay, individually. They'll come on in, and you will have a rousing ovation, I'm sure. And then they're going to take their place up on stage, and we're we're going to begin now prior to the evening tonight we did kind of all join together and I said we're going to you know keep the time and keep everybody at focus I don't know this is going to be a challenge I think I may be more of a referee than a host but they did tell me nothing is off limits and we do need your participation tonight so if you have questions I'm going to run around like Phil Donahue and take questions from all of you I know there are a lot of people in the room you know Barry Lillis is here he's a Buffalo Broadcaster Hall of Fame we have a lot of great folks here, Van Taylor, musicians, Rick, you know, a lot of great folks, and we need your participation. And I know a lot of you worked in radio with these gentlemen over the years. All right, now, that said, we'll start with Sandy Beach, because I see him right at the front door, all right? There he is, coming to Buffalo in the late 1960s from Hartford, our giant of Buffalo radio. He was on the air and programmed the great WKBW radio. Part of the morning team at 102 FM when it was called Magic 102. And he is now the host of the top rated afternoon talk show on WBEN. Cities like Hartford, Dallas, San Francisco, and Milwaukee have all enjoyed his talents, but it is Buffalo that is truly his home. A three-time nominee for Billboard magazine, personality, and a member of the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame. And he does tell me he's a big fan of Olson's and Chef's Pasta Sauce. Absolutely, there you are. Our next giant spent time behind the microphone in Los Angeles, Montana, Greensboro, Spokane, and Salt Lake. But it's the Cosmic Cowboy. There he is. He may drop down and do 50. There you go. The, the Cosmic Cowboy arrived in 1973, but it was obvious that this city was going to be the one where he would make his mark. Because he was on WKBW, then WISL, origin of his beloved Whistle Missile, we'll hear more about that tonight, then on WGR. Nothing was too challenging for this man, from embracing his job as a program director, camping out on a billboard for charity, running for public office, or tearing up the links as a professional golfer, which we'll find out about. He is a member of the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame, Shane, Brother Shane. <laughs> Next, I see a gentleman with the same color hair as mine, although I'm, uh, oh, so much younger, from Pierre Puck and the various voices that he has created. This giant of Buffalo radio moved your fanny for over a quarter of a century on WKBW. He got his inspiration from the Boys Club in South Buffalo, where his first job was in Countersport. From Countersport, PA, he moved back to Buffalo, and of course that's where he was entrenched on radio and television for decades. Who could forget his banter with Joey Reynolds or their comedy hit, Rats in My Room? He was the Buffalo Bills public address announcer, spent a decade doing mornings at WHTT, kicked off a short-lived revival of WWKBAM. but if you ask him what he's most proud of, he will likely tell you his family. And in addition to the Buffalo Hall of Fame, he is also... <laughs> <laughs> Danny is also a member of the New York State Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Danny Neverett. <laughs> Growing up as Joey Pinto in South Buffalo, it might be easier to actually name the cities this gentleman didn't work in. But 
Those that he did include Wheeling, West Virginia, Pittsburgh, LA, Hartford, Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Denver, and of course, his hometown of Buffalo, New York. Whether he was playing music, he originated the Shock Talk format, hosted the first nationwide satellite broadcast, launched television shows from Miami to Western New York to Denver, but it was his tenure at WKBW with Danny, Rats in My Room, plus that dramatic resignation that we'll hear about, nailing his shoes to the program director's door that we all remember. And he's even written a book, Let a Smile Be Your Umbrella, But Don't Get a Mouthful of Rain. Joey Reynolds. Watch the step, you're right on the edge of the stage. For well over 50 years, our next radio giant Don't has like always you. made us they laugh. Might. From his arrival at WKBW in the 60s through his tenure at GR, BUF, and WBEN. Originally from the New York City area, spinning records as a teen in Asbury Park. His first job took him to West Virginia. And in addition to Buffalo, fans in Boston also got the opportunity to enjoy his talents. Not bad for a guy who almost became an accountant. Now, that might that's true. It might be the reason why he transitioned into ad sales so well. He's one of the top billers still at Entercom Radio. And who could forget all the commercials with the lampshade on his head? Stan Roberts! Stan, you came here in the 60s, yes. and, and, and uh, Sandy, you came also in the 60s. 68. What was it about Buffalo, the, what was it about the city that, that not only brought you here, but then brought you back? Well, it wasn't the city, it was KB. Uh, KB could be heard up and down the east coast of America uh, and getting a job at KB was like being on network radio and as I said I grew up with uh, Joey Reynolds, I didn't grow up but I, I got my interest with Joey Reynolds and it's one of the reasons I hated Dan Nevereth when I first met him because I only heard Joey, I didn't hear anybody else and they, KB had a contest, who was going to be president of KB country? And I'm thinking, this is a slam dunk. It's got to be Joey. Joey's fabulous. He's got to win. No, he didn't win. Nevereth won. Yeah. And I've hated him for it ever since. I'm Italian. We don't forget. But it was always KB. KB was a very special place. I'm telling you, uh, being on, and I'm not bullshit. Being on this stage with these guys is just terrific for me. Uh, Tell them about our first meeting. First meeting, Dan Nevereth. When I was uh, in Hartford and I got the job at KB, there was a guy that had worked at KB in the summer and he said, I'm going to give you a tip. Everybody will put you on. Everybody. Don't believe anything anybody says because it'll be a lie. Okay. So I was in the recording studio before I'd even gone on the air with Al Laffler. I was cutting some promos and I see a face looking through the, through the door, through the glass in the door. And this is 1968. Keep this in mind. So I see this face and he goes, yeah, come on in. He puts his hands on my shoulders. He says, I'm Dan Nevereth. I'm homosexual, and he kisses me on the lips. I had been warned about this, and I was ready. So I said, well, I'm Sandy Beach, and so am I. And I grabbed him by the ears. And let me just say this, he's one hell of a kisser. But Joey, you left, now, you know, your good friend Danny stayed, but you left and went on the journey, if you will, with so got, many markets. I was fired. You know, I mean, I got So fired. were we all. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, but we have to compare radio to other facets of yeah. show business, you know. Yeah. Uh, nobody ever asks Tom Hanks why he has 40 movies. You know, I mean, you, you move on to the next thing. When something is done, it's done. I always took it as being a move of show business and economics, you know. You make your money and you make your mark and you leave, you move on. I just stayed 14 years in New York on WOR, it's a long time, you know, and I kept the one job that everybody always wants to have, that one job for life. But don't forget, I come from the Buffalo area where we had steel plants and you die on that one job. You get a gold watch after 25 years, you get a pension and retirement and you go home. I mean, you know, we had these lifetime jobs. I don't think we have this anymore. There's no lifetime jobs in anything anymore. This is a, this is a, 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 a it's a shop talk thing, but it's okay. Everybody should know this anyway. No, we, I, want we, them to, I want them to be impressed. First of all, I got the job at NBC from Sandy Beach. 
because Sandy was in San Francisco and he worked for the guy who became the president of the radio division or the manager of the station, John Hayes. Sandy recommended me. I was in Philly. I had a hot show in Philly. It was like Howard Stern was, where we decided that we were going to make fun of everybody and not play any records. And that was the beginning of the, of the transition of talk radio, you know, other than political arguments, which are, Sandy's doing that now. You know, but we, 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 have, we had, uh, uh, I had a really good job in Philly, and I was offered a half a million dollars to go to New York and be on the air in the afternoon and replace Howard Stern. So I turned it down. Mm. Mm. <laughs> How smart I was. <laughs> Danny, tell that story about Philadelphia because you actually, there is one story, I don't know if the audience knows it, but you almost left Buffalo at one point. Yes, the, uh, the only real serious time that I considered leaving Buffalo was, and the background is Joey again. Joey, like I said, worked in every major market, but everywhere Joey went, he would call and offer me a job. And I said, Joey, you know, you're not the program director. You can't give me the job. If they want me, they'll call me. Of course, they never called me. So Joey was in Philadelphia, and he called me, and he said, hey, they want you to come down here to Philadelphia. They heard about you, and, and I told them you know, what you do and everything, and, and they want you to come here. I said, Joey, we talked about this before. If they, if they want me there, then have somebody call me. Have somebody in management call me. Well. About three days later, the program director called me, and he said, we're interested in talking to you. I'd like to fly you down to Philadelphia, and you can stay with Joey. You can stay at Joey's house overnight. We'll show you the station. We'll talk. So, okay. Day off. I'll fly down to Philadelphia. Probably won't turn out to be anything. I made the mistake of staying at Joey's house. <laughs> Joey was living. Now, I have to understand, Joey has made a lot of money over the years, but... <laughs> Joey has lost a lot of money over the years. It so stick. He lived, he lived on a horse ranch outside of Philadelphia, absolutely gorgeous. I don't know how many acres, but there were horses around and beautiful greenery. And I'm well, thinking, well, it was marijuana. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, I could go for this. Marie would like this. We live out in the country, work in Philadelphia. So it turned out that they weren't really interested in me doing an afternoon show. They had talked about doing a morning show. And I realized that eventually in my career, I'd have to do a morning show because that at the time is where, where the money was, really. And that's where the longevity that's where was, I was to do a morning show. Stand it. Okay. So I went back and I'm thinking, you know, I really don't want to have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go. So I'll tell everybody at KB what happened down there. So I was able to use that as leverage, and then I made a few more dollars, and I stayed at KB. Now, a while later, Stan Roberts leaves to go to Boston, big station in Boston. It was a happy day for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't bad for me. <laughs> so I talked to Sandy, and I said, Sandy, they want me to do the morning show. They want me to replace Stan Roberts, he's going to Boston, they want me to replace him. And I said, I don't want to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I, I, I don't. He said, wait a minute. Now, all of us at that time worked six days a week. Yeah. Even Clint Buhlman, God bless him, wherever he is up there. <laughs> even Clint Buhlman worked six days a week, and he owned Buffalo Radio. Now, if you were the number two morning show in Buffalo while Clint Buhlman was number one, that was fine. I mean, you couldn't hope to be more than number two with him. So Sandy said to me, tell them you'll do the morning show if they let you work five days. Wow. Okay. So I went in and talked to him, and I said, listen, if you're going to ruin my life, which you will be getting me up at 4 o'clock in the morning, if you're going to ruin my life, you can only have five days of my life. If you want to do that, then I'll do the morning show. Well, it worked. I did the morning show. And I remember reading a story from, it was about, disc jockeys in major markets. And the one guy, what really struck home was he said, I love what I do, I'm very successful at what I do, but I'm always tired, always. It's a, it's just, you're never, you know, you never get enough sleep. And to, because of that, sleep was very precious to me. You know, I'll take a nap during the afternoon. I take it even if I'm not tired, right. because I, you know, because I can. Our WBBZ-TV special, Giants of Buffalo Radio, will return right after this. Now, we return you back to Giants of Buffalo Radio. 
Stan, let's talk about some of the funny stories because you had talked about uh, an April Fool's prank that oh, involved yeah. Hartford and Buffalo. And, and I want to get to some of the, because the commonality among all you gentlemen is that WKBW Radio was what brought you here, and there were so many promotions yep. that were so off the charts at the time. But right. uh, this one was pretty interesting. Well, what we did was, we were leading up to April Fool's Day, and we talked with uh, what could we do to really be, get attention, and we, co we corresponded with the station in Hartford. BOP. BOP. And the guys on the air here and there both started to say like three weeks out, I want you to know that our contract ends April 14th. And we're talking to management and they're not being very friendly. And one day you may turn on the radio and we won't be here. So I just want, you know, we just kind of kept throwing that in. April 14th, we flew to Hartford and their staff flew here. And the next morning, we went on the air, and the guy's name in the morning was Bobby Bland. And I go on at 6 a.m. and I say, good morning, I'm Bobby, and if there's anything I am, I'm Bland. <laughs> and just, and then, so the phone started ringing, you're not Bobby Bland, they fired Bobby Bland. You're some son of a, who took Bobby Bland's together. And they started, now, then he checked with me and said, do you have a delay? No, we don't use a delay. Well, the language that was coming off the phone and on the air, well, we don't care. This is not our radio station, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we just let it fly. But a, a great part of the story was Danny always wanted to have fun. We all wanted to have fun. And we decided, how about on the trip to Hartford, I'll wear a trench coat and act like a cop. <laughs> You were put in handcuffs, and I'm like, you're my prisoner, and I'm taking you to Hartford to go to jail, whatever, go to court. And so, of course, he agrees, he'll do anything. And we go, and, and he was flirting with a girl at the, before, you know, when we were checking in, and she was getting interested, and then I said, okay, the time is now. I put the cuffs on him. She, it's like he disappeared. She, <laughs> we go to get on the plane, and alongside of me, there's another guy really wearing a trench coat, and he really had a guy in handcuffs. So here's me with my prisoner, and he with his. And I said, Danny, you want to have fun? Make a break for it. <laughs> His career would have ended right there. They would have shot him down. <laughs> Shane, Shane, where did the nickname Cosmic Cowboy come from? Is it because you just really wore a lot of cowboy hats? Or was there something cosmic about your voice? Where did the nickname, and who branded you that? Buffalo Courier Express. Buffalo Courier Express did it. John Otto was the one that popularized it. He made it, everybody, you know, in Western New York took that tag, but they took it from John Otto because at that time I think the news was kicking the Express's ass. So the Sunday Magazine, which was that, by the way, as long as you're going to do this, you still, this is not right that you have the original Buffalo Courier Express of my photograph and all you're doing is some little 5 by 7 over my damn shoulder and you've got all of them and all I got is this worn out old I thing. I brought so out the whole issue. If you want a copy, Marie's Free Market is the first of oh. <laughs> I want to mention. I knew this, this was going to be a rough row for me to hoe tonight. I knew that. Shane was the kind of guy he would tell you all these really weird things that he was able to do. And do. And the problem was he was able to do most of it. Okay. But, but you never believe. Oh yeah, I won the hand rest, arm wrestling championship. You know. Okay. I got the fastest car at Lancaster Speedway. <laughs> he did. Okay. I can do this. I can do that. Okay. Well, now he was into karate. He's, now he's the karate guy. Yeah, I got a black and pink and uh, no, forget about it was the pink. It's Tai Chi, you twist. Okay, so we both happen to go to the same gym, <laughs> and I'm standing up against the wall. I'm doing some stretching up against the back wall like this, and there's Shane. He's probably 20 feet away from me, and he goes, Aah! and he comes running toward me. <laughs> I'm, I'm up against the wall. Now his leg came up this high. <laughs> right past my head, boom, <laughs> through the wall, <laughs> right through the plaster. Now, he had trouble getting his foot back out. He gets his foot. <laughs> Shane, you almost killed me. He said, let's go in the other room. I'm so embarrassed. I can't, I can't. 
So we had to go hide in the next room. A big hole in the wall. A man almost killed him. That was Tom Haney's place, yeah. the 2001 Club, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it true, Shane, you hung off a billboard for a, for a promotional stunt? Yeah. Bob Rich, some of these guys may remember this. This is 88. And we had built Pilot Field. You know, and, and we're trying to build Buffalo. We're trying to build it and boost it so that we can sell it and become this great population center, Buffalo, Toronto, over the next two generations. Try and do that. So the riches and everybody get this pilot field, and it's gorgeous. You know it. It's drop dead gorgeous. First thing he wants to do is prove to everybody we can be a major league baseball team. And we did. Everybody thought we could do it. So they build this pilot field that we can, we can expand to 44,000. We can play. And we get this triple A. Everything goes. And. He lets his alligator mouth overload his summon bird ass, and he says, we can do the AAA baseball game. Well, they gave it to him, and we had to sell it out. because The we All-Star game you're talking about. Yeah, right? the yeah. AAA All-Star game in 88. I'm here to and help. We, oh. <laughs> Except when you steal a set from me. What was I talking about? The <laughs> AAA baseball. We well, can I, do it. Oh, AAA baseball. Yeah, we can do it. So we didn't get it done. Now we're like... God, I can't remember. It's like 10, three, three, two, 10 days, something like that. And he calls a meeting to everybody, radio, television, got the whole, whole media's in there. And he's saying, we have problems. We can't embarrass the city of Buffalo, New York. Boom, boom, boom. Can you think of anything to help? And after about an hour, boom, 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 I finally said, and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, why don't I just eat, sleep, walk, talk, and crap out of the scoreboard? And I'll do my show from there, and I won't leave until all the tickets are sold. So for the next nine days, I lived literally 24 hours a day in the scoreboard of Pilot Field. And every game we played, you all remember how, like the scoreboard, and then you got these rails. There's, there's some rails in front of them guarding the thing. And people would do this, blah, blah, blah. And I don't mean to take so much time. And I would come out out of the scoreboard, lock my legs on the banister and lay my head down in the field toward the, toward the field. And then I'd do these sit-ups, these pull-ups while the audience would count. By the time they counted 10, I was so dead I couldn't stand up. And the very last day, to, to wrap it up, they do the, the thing where, where they have this, you know, like a, like a thrower, a ball thrower, and somebody from the audience gets to come out and the shooter will shoot up three balls, and if you catch it, you get a Pizza Hut Pepsi, and if you catch two, you get a Pizza Hut Pepsi and French fries, but if you catch all three of them, you get pizzas. That's 20,000 people. So they've decided I'm going to do it. Now I've already done this, so I'm like this. Come out, I get a great glove, they put me in center field, and the machine breaks. <laughs> So the guy from the opposing conference, the, he get, the coach gets it, they give him a fungal bat. So he's at home field, I'm way deep in center field, right underneath the thing, and he pops one up over second base. Well, I get it on the dead end, okay, fine. So then he goes, this is now, I'm ready to die. He pulls one down the left field line, near home run. So I do another 80 yards over there, I bring it back. Now the last one on there, he pops this thing up, and I catch it on the fly as I died two steps inside of second base. And the uh, crowd goes nuts. And Mike Bellani, does anybody remember Mike oh, Bellani? Yeah. So Mike's standing over there on the first baseline and he's going like this because he's going to stop me and say this is the first time this has ever been done and you're a hero and all that. And I ran past him into the hallway and threw up and he had to grab me and pull, pull me out and I'm going like this and everybody's going, yeah, you're so cool. And I'm going, mm -hmm. and I'm fainting. I'm literally, I've got my hands in his, in his pants. I'm trying to hold him up and say, please give me the hospital. Give me Get me out of here, get me out of here. And, and he, he says, you can do it, you can do it. I says, I can't take it, I can't take it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. And he did, they literally, he literally dragged my feet to the stairs and I fell down the steps uh, in there and just puked my guts out and I'm sorry I took so much time. But you brought it that, up. That's that, a vision, Shane, that's, and you've given us one. That's yeah. one of the, that my mission but has always been did. the people. You made it work. Definitely. 
I got to tell you uh, never a story. We used to have a basketball team at KB called the KB Yo-Yos, and we would go and play uh, uh, faculties and whatever uh, for, uh, for charity. <laughs> uh, and then when we come back, we get something to eat, all right? Ted's, uh, we were playing in Ontario, and Ted's had a location right at the bridge, all right? And when you walked in there, it wasn't one line. It was like five lines, a line in front of each window. And we were tired, and it was a long game, and whatever. And we came in from different, uh, different doors. Uh, and there were people already in Ted's when we got there. We get in different lines. I happen to get in back of him, all right? Now, I'm tired. I want to get home. It, it's been a tough night. So what happens? It's time for him to order. He pretends he can't speak English. Yeah. <laughs> and the girl is trying to be so helpful. She's speaking slowly. No. And he's saying, like, he's saying, well, sausage, uh, no, she's going, oh, would you like this? And I, I was disgusted, and it obviously showed on my face. I, I was just totally disgusted, and I look over the other lines, and they're looking at him because he's getting help, but they're also looking at me. I'm the ugly American. <laughs> this guy, look, he's, he's making faces. This other guy can't speak English. <laughs> so I decide to see how fast Nevereth can think. I know he's a fast thinker, but I didn't tell him I was going to do it. So while he's doing sausage, whatever, I tapped him on the shoulder. He turned around. I slapped him. Bam! <laughs> right across the face. Everybody goes, oh! <laughs> I said, you're in America now, pal. Speak English. <laughs> and he pivoted around. He said, two red hots and an order fry. <laughs> One of, one of the things that uh, we, we were talking about KB and you talked about the great Jeff K who, mm. who passed away and I know you know you remember his legacy and one of the things that he was responsible some of you gentlemen were participating in was a great Halloween stunt in 1968 with the War of the Worlds. How many of you remember that here in the audience tonight? <laughs> I mean, it was from, and I wasn't here at the time. I came in '83, but from what I hear from from Bob Kaczynski and uh, and the stories that I've seen, it was quite something. I mean, how did that come together? And you know, okay, people uh, still remember it decades later. Jeff K was probably the most talented writer. He was a production guy that you, I mean, you wouldn't believe the stuff that he came up with and the, the sound effects and the music and everything like that. Well, he had an idea for the War of the Worlds. He wanted to do the show and use the original script. But we couldn't get permission from the owners of the script. That was the one that Orson Welles did way back when, okay? So he said, well, we'll do our own version of it, and we'll, we'll localize it. We'll make it in Western New York. So he got together. He wrote this, put the script together, got people from the station. Almost everybody at the station was involved in the production of the War of the Worlds. I was the host of the Halloween show. I was Windermere the Warlock. And I would talk in there, well, very, very, thank you very much. Time to play. <laughs> <laughs> nice time. <Okay>, so <laughs> that's my yeah, radio ah, voice. Ah, 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 ah. But anyway, <laughs> no, no, I you. was not on that show. Herb Weinstein was on it. All the newsmen were on it. Uh, some of the disc jockeys were on it. Okay. But I was just the host of the show. So I was anxious to get home once I introduced it so that I could listen to the show with my family. So I'm going to stop and get some donuts on the way home. We'll have some cider and donuts, and we'll listen to the show at home. I went into a donut shop on Southwestern Boulevard, Orchard Park, and there were two guys standing in front of the counter and a woman behind the counter, and they're talking. And a guy said, did you hear what happened on Grand Island? A spaceship landed on Grand Island. <laughs> And they're, they're checking, and the both guys are going back and forth. Yeah, I heard it. it was on the radio right now. And the girl said, "Really? That's like a spaceship? Yeah." And there's all kinds of problems there. And there's like, they're they're shooting ray guns and everything. It's awful. And, and I said, "Excuse me, excuse me. That that's just the dramatization. That's on the radio." And the guy go, "Oh yeah, I knew that. I, yeah. <laughs> I I knew that." But that was just one example of the kind of things that Jeff could do. Stan, what's your story? Well, when I first was doing mornings at KB Radio, my morning newsman was Irv Weinstein. And we had news five minutes before the hour, and he did a terrific job. And one day he said to me, Stan, I got a call, you know, Channel 7 is right across the parking lot, and they, they want me to do news on television. And I said, you know, there's Channel 4 and Channel 2, and then there's this asterisk 
at 11 o'clock where Channel 7 is. I said, I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> I would try that. I remember that. I remember Thank that. goodness he didn't you listen to you, Stan, on that one. You did. You saw Don't it. take any financial you advice from yeah, this no. guy. We're always pulling jokes on each other. And the one thing I remember, Fred Kleste, we actually flew the KB Yo-Yos in virtually a snowstorm to a game in Pennsylvania. And we got on this plane at Buffalo International, and we're taxiing down the runway, and Fred Clestine, who was gullible, was in front of me, and I said, Fred, we're in trouble. What, why? I said, look, they don't have snow tires on this plane. We're doomed. Well, he freaked. And uh, of course, we took off, everything was fine. But we had the whole staff, I mean, all the, all the jocks, the, the whole staff was in this silly plane, you know, at risk. And another time we went to Pennsylvania, Danny Nevers was driving, we hit a slick spot, and started, we slid into the guardrail, and again, we were all at risk. But we survived, because I see Danny is here himself in, in the flesh. Our WBBZ TV special, Giants of Buffalo Radio, will return right after this. Now, we return you back to Giants of Buffalo Radio. Hey, you know what? Let's flash forward to where you guys are now, because, Joy, I know you're in New York, and you keep up with the technology. And let's talk a little bit about how the technology has changed this business, because you are very involved in Facebook and Twitter, and, you know, you are right there with it. I, I text with two thumbs. But has, it killed, has well. it killed radio as you remember it, as we all remember it, as we're remembering tonight? Well, I, I, I think uh, you should know that the uh, cell phones use AM radio towers. That's why they don't sound good. You know, I mean, they need to improve the quality of them. Uh, we, we take better pictures than we have phone calls because we haven't moved along into that technology of satellite. It's very expensive, that's why. Yeah, I'm involved in the uh, Consumer Electronics Show. I go every year to the seminars and I attend all of the conferences so I can learn and stay ahead of the technology. I think uh, one of the things that we're doing right now, I'm working on a triple cast which is radio, television, and internet globally so that it's on all three media for more than one demographic. Because you got a lot of, some young people in the room here and some older ones and some people who are here with their walkers and then some people who have some of uh, Justin Bieber's pubic hairs for souvenirs. And you know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's a little crowd. And you wanna, you wanna reach everybody. So we used to call it broadcasting and it became narrow casting exactly. without making a big speech out of it. And it's I have. It's true, broadcasting. You wanna, you exactly know, we, right. we, wanna, we wanna reach everybody and you can't have everybody anymore. You can't put everybody in the same room. You can't even do it at home. You know, you're lucky. If somebody's watching Judge Judy in the afternoon, chances are they're not working. You know, I mean, this is not a time where you sit in front of a television set and, and watch it in, as a family anymore, except for maybe some specials. Mm. I, I think uh, right now what Sandy's doing, for instance, on the, on the radio, if you're in the car, he's, he, you get a charge out of it. It's exciting. It's got a certain magic to it, and, a, and, a, and, and it's okay for AM. But I think AM ought to move over to the broadband. It's digital. It should be where FM is. Yeah, we're on 107.7, yeah. too. And we you took got, it over got, by It's, it's going to happen. And when everybody moves over to realize that this particular thing is a television, it's a communications walkie-talkie, it's the Dick Tracy watch that we all had from our age group, and it's also, it should make toast, you know. Uh, I mean, it looks like you got a couple of texts there. So anyway, right, that's what I'm doing. John, one, one thing I want to mention. I'm sorry, you talk about the difference. I'm going to do questions. Uh, when, K, when KB was kicking ass, uh, they didn't run it like a hardware store. They ran it like show business. They did. And the deal was this, okay? And I know later I on, my deal with Norm Schrutt was this when I was programming. I said, here's our deal. I'll put on the show, That's you'll right. run the box exactly office. Exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so KB brought people in. They allowed them to perform. I mean, as I've said, you know my admiration for all of these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and they let us do it. And they protected us. And sometimes we offended clients and whatever. Oh, yeah. But we had, we had management behind us. Uh, it wasn't run, as I said, like a hardware store and I think that's hard to find. I want to get, One thing I about get. Can I talk about music just very briefly? People would say to me, wow, what a lovely thing it was. You could sit there and listen to that music oh, you know, and you got paid to listen to the music. I never listened to the music. When the record was on, all I was concerned with was when this record ends, what am I going to do? I didn't care exactly. what was playing well, as long as he was exactly. Exactly. Well, you I'm should also from notice that, that Danny, 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 that was way music, I'm not. Danny was music director at WKBW. And he was in charge of all the music. He'd have to listen to everything that came yeah. in. And, and that's why Rats in My Room got to be number one. We put <laughs> it on the track. <laughs> 
By the way, if you have a copy of Rats in My Room, it's worth $14. Is it? I got one. Two o'clock. I want to just say one other thing about my friend Sandy. You said something before I disagree with. You said something about uh, talk radio not being entertaining. It's, uh, you know, the left or right or up or down. This guy is one of the most entertaining talk show hosts in America. Not only, not only does he handle a subject and hang up on you, but if you don't agree, but he's also one of the funniest guys ever. Really, there's no question about it, and that's why he is still on the radio, and that's why I'm. And I'm not. Well, he sounds like. Doesn't it sound like he likes me. <laughs> Let me just tell you a story. By the way, I'm starting a new business. When when we were together. He, uh, if, if, if somebody needed somebody for an appearance, Danny would do it. He would do any appearance, any place, any time. For, for money, money. For money. For money. Of course. For money. I like to go home and ride my horses and do other things. So one day, Danny uh, says to me, did that minister from Eden call you? I said, no. He said, yeah. He wanted me to come down there playing Eddie Fainer, the king in his court. It's a fundraiser. I couldn't do it. I told him you'd love to do it. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay. When he does call, I got to be ready for him. So phone rings a couple days later. It's the minister. He says, Sandy, uh, uh, we'd like you to come down. We're playing Eddie Fainer, the king in his court, and it's going to be great. Now I'm thinking all along, how am I going to get out of this? The guy's a minister, you know? And uh, so I'm saying, I'm sorry, I, I just can't do it. He says, I'll tell you what, you don't even have to play the whole game. Just pay part of it. Uh, three innings, three innings, that'll be good. I said, no, I really, I have to decline. He says, Here's the deal. One inning. Come down and, and do one inning. That's all we expect. And now I'm thinking, how am I going to get back at Neverth? I said to him, have you, I can't play softball. He said, why? I said, have you ever seen me? He said, no. I said, I have no right hand. <laughs> There's this dead silence. And then I said, Danny never told you to call me, didn't he? He said, yes, he did. I said, he's always doing cruel things like that. <laughs> so there, Mr. Nice Guy now. Yeah. The, kind, the kind of things that would happen, people would call up and they'd try to get you to do an appearance, and they, they would always say the same thing. I'd say, well, uh, you know, there's a fee for that. Well, <laughs> there's food. <laughs> And the big clincher was, and afterwards there's dancing. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> wow, oh, yeah. I, I, well, let me look at my calendar. I, I'm busy, right? Okay, one time a fella called up and he said, Dan, we'd like you to come out to this event. He said, we're naming you Disc Jockey of the Year. I said, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's really, really nice. I said, oh, well, how, much, how much does it pay? And he said, well, we, we don't, don't have any funds. <laughs> we don't have any funds, but he said, you're going to be named Disc Jockey of the Year at this event. He said, I think it'll be, it'll be really good for you. And I said, well, let me check. So I do the fake calendar thing. And I said, oh, you know what? I, I, I'm busy that night. Honest to God, he said to me, well, could you give me the name of some other Disc Jockey? <laughs> we have another question right over here. Go ahead, man. I presume that all you gentlemen are retired now. Would you mind telling us what you're doing to enjoy your retirement? Well, aside from maybe Sandy, listener. and maybe not Stan. I don't think she listens to your show, Sandy. I, I got that, tells yeah. me She was a kid. Woman. She used to listen when she was under the covers. Right. <laughs> yeah, what are you guys doing now? I'm not even tired, let alone retired. <laughs> what are you talking about? I haven't. I worked every day of my life, and I still do. And, and in the business of radio and television and, and internet, I'm trying to put all three together. That's what I was just saying before. So I'd like to say that, you know. Uh, and I stay active in all these communities because I think it's important to bring everybody to a community, common unity. And it's it's really uh, it doesn't sound funny, but you know you want to put everybody in the same room again, like we are here. Look at with all this joy tonight and all this laughter because you're hearing good stories about people and they're mostly from the past but you know what we have them today they're not these are it's not just the background it's going on right now you should have been in the room when we were waiting to get in here you should have heard what we were talking about back there you Joey, would, i gotta ask you this what and i've never asked you publicly when you were doing uh, nights on kb how the hell did you do it i mean really that the volume of of entertainment was overwhelming 
Well, you know, I, I just came off, I'll answer your question differently. I just finished a television series in Times Square on the NASDAQ building on NBC TV. And I was doing it every night for two hours, and we had no writers. And, and, I, and so they asked me last week, the Daily News reporter said, how did you do two hours without any writers? Because Jimmy Fallon has 20 writers, you know, Letterman and, and, uh, and Leno, they're all greased with writers. I'm on their digital NBC channel, and we had a full crew of people, but I didn't, you, you just either have it or you don't have it. You know, you have a desire to get on the air and you want to have some fun. So I think that that's what we're all about here. You know, we, these guys here, all of us in this, on this stage here, could really make a show because we want, we love the people, we want to, we want to have fun with everybody, and we're not done. I'm not done yet. And you know, when you go to bed with a gorilla, you're done when the gorilla's done. Just to answer. <laughs> you may be asked tonight uh, to sing "Rats in My Room." Uh, I don't sing. What is? What is, what is I lip sync. What is the origins of that? <laughs> Well, we had a, uh, in, when I was in Hartford, now we're going to go back to Hartford. Uh, you know, we all have had humble beginnings before we made KB. And uh, in Hartford, I had a fan club. And somebody handed me a box when I was leaving the station one night on Asylum Street, well named. And as I'm leaving there, I had a box of something that moved, and it was mice. So uh, I brought it up there, and, and I started, I brought it up to the station. And I started to sing this little rat, Rats in My Room thing, and Danny expounded upon it and, and we, when I got to KB, and we made fun, and it just evolved. It evolved, you know. It's, it was dumb. You know, things that, dumb things work in our society. How many records actually sold, you know? No, nobody will ever know, because we didn't count them in those days. We just kept putting them out and pretending we had a number one record. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's a lot of it is showbiz. It's showbiz. You know, it's like politics. Rats in my room. Our WBBZ TV special, Giants of Buffalo Radio, will return right after this. Now, we return you back to Giants of Buffalo Radio. Another one here. I see we have a Hall of Fame pro wrestler, Dick Byer, the Destroyer, here. And I know a couple of these guys have gotten into the ring with pro wrestlers, and I think they have a couple oh, of stories. Oh, yeah. About that. Oh, yeah. Joey. Yeah. Did you wrestle one? Freddie Clestine and I did the world champion Gallagher Brothers yep. uh, tag team match. <laughs> and uh, I weighed about 450 pounds. And uh, I, was, I was wrestling with Freddie, and we were in the ring for the March of Dimes at Memorial Auditorium at the time yep. it was called. And there were 10,000 people. I did that. And I was thrown to the mat, and I was bleeding. But I didn't feel anything because they broke a capsule on me. But I didn't know it was fixed. <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard that, that anybody ever did that. There See, that video. Now you know why There's I a video the media. On that. You've there, got video, all I've got is There's speeches. a video on that. Oh, yeah. I did that, Bruiser. I got, I got Greg in the yard. This is Dick Byer, the destroyer, everybody. Right here, right hey. up front. Woo. And you know, guys, in addition... In addition to Dick's career here in, in the United States, Dick was huge overseas uh, in the Asian countries, and you were one of the first guests on Regis Philbin's San Diego talk show, I remember, too, Dick. That's right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Regis and I are good friends since 52 years. <laughs> it's great to have you here tonight. Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Uh, KB did such great productions like the thing about whether Paul McCartney was dead or not. And there were yes. so many. Is there any way with the Internet that any of that can be listened to anymore? You know, with YouTube, do you folks have Remember stuff you? that's available dead, for us to listen Paul to again? Dead. Yeah. So I was on a radio dead. station that Remember? got ruined by oh, yeah. that. I was on a radio station that actually got ruined by that 18 months. We uh, at KB, I sat down with Jeff Kay and we worked very late at night. We actually, he rigged up a turntable that we could play, but manually we could turn the record backwards. backwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now the Beatles, the Beatles put a lot of stuff, they, they, don't, they never really talk much about this, but they put stuff on that album so that very. they did it on purpose. They, oh, yeah. they had to do it on purpose. And they dropped in sound effects, and they dropped in pieces of movie uh, dialogue, and, and all these things that made it look like uh, Paul McCartney had actually been killed in an accident and had been replaced by a look-alike so that they could keep the legend the of, the, of the Beatles going. A question from uh, Carl Wilson, Sharon up. You guys were the kings, I mean in the heyday, you guys were the kings of AM radio. 
When FM radio started to gain in popularity and start, popularity started coming on, did you see that as something like, like oh God, this, this is the nail in the coffin, or did you see it as an opportunity? Well, what was going through your head when FM was I coming think on? we saw the weakness. Uh, one night I had to run 17 commercials, 17 commercials back to back. Yeah. AM and A's bought a segment, so they bought the pre-15 minutes and the post and the 15, and you had your regular log, and, and I knew, you know, the 97 Rock or whatever were running uh, no no commercials. And and when that hit, we knew that uh, we either cut it down or not. I liked it because I was doing a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to get across for a second ago. When you were discussing that, we had an 18-month war in Utah. Uh, on this whole thing about Paul McCartney debt, and when you're talking about that stuff, they actually did it. But please bear in mind, some of us weren't morning and midday guys, some of us were out there in the nightclubs, some of us were with the freaks, some of us knew what people were doing, and that stuff was taken out of the acid days with the guys, with the Beatles. All that stuff about Paul McCartney and everything, that's all stuff you do while you're can I say the word yeah. hi? And if you play Rats in My Room backwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Danny's ever even smoked if, a cigarette, have you? If John Lennon were alive today, he'd have a memory of Buffalo. Uh, one time Jeff Kay came to me and said, John Lennon's in Toronto for the Bed-In for Peace. Uh, we got a chance to interview him. Are you interested? I said, I'm interested. He's the most famous guy in the world. Of course I'm interested. So he was supposed to call at a certain time. I'm working with Jim Adler, and uh, we're getting near the time he's supposed to be on. He hadn't called yet. Now i got to go into my stop set of commercials. So I'm watching Adler, and he's going, no. So I, I decide I'll, I'll do my live spot, which, strangely enough, was for Malecki Wieners. Okay? <laughs> I get about 20 seconds into it and I see Adler gives me the John Lennon's on the line. Now I got a choice. If I go directly to Lennon, we're going to have to make up the Malecki Wiener commercial. <laughs> or do you think he can hang on for 40 seconds? Well, unfortunately, it was Malecki Wiener, the Wiener the world awaited. <laughs> I got the most famous guy in the world holding on the phone while I do a hot dog commercial in Buffalo. Now, he was very good about it. He had a great sense of humor, but sometimes well, you got to do commerce. Well, let me tell you about Danny with this. We turned down bringing the Beatles here to Memorial Auditorium. Oh. Because uh, oh. we were brain surgeons. Yeah. We were so smart. But we brought the Dave Clark Five, who were their friends, yeah. too. And you know, there was a, this is another little sidebar. I'm Catholic, as I mentioned at the beginning of this thing, and we didn't used to eat meat on Friday. Remember that? Mm -hmm, I remember and it was part of the church law, and you would fast during Lent. You know, you, yeah. you didn't know what you were going to give up. We gave up ratings. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we had the, the McDonald's was the second McDonald's in the country was on Sheridan. The second one after Ray Honorable Croc built his in, uh, empire in San Diego. We had the second one here in the country. And there were 15 cent hamburgers. Yeah. And they were a big account of ours. We had the sponsorship of McDonald's. You know, and, and they came on. I was the number one disc jockey in the country. And Billboard magazine was celebrating me. And McDonald's made this gigantic time by. So I get on the air and I said, you can even eat the hamburgers on Friday because there ain't no meat in them. <laughs> You know, uh, nothing's changed. We're, we're living in a, in, a, in a situation where people are now having to come to the realization that a lot of these things are about money. And uh, it's simply put, I was not getting enough money. And I continued to complain. And they didn't want to give me any. They didn't want to pay me for anything. And they had a telethon. So as part of my hidden anger with the audience, I got on the air one night and I had Frank Gorshin come in from the TV set for the telethon. And he was doing impressions on the Ed Sullivan Show back in those days. And I asked him to do some impressions and he didn't want to talk. He didn't want to do anybody on my show. And I said, hey, they're paying you 10 grand, do something. Which was not supposed to be known because it's Variety Club, it's a telethon. We weren't supposed to tell people that people were paid right. to make this money. Nobody knew that Jerry Lewis was making money for his telethons. You know, we weren't thinking that way. We, right. Our little bowling money at the throwaway lanes was going to charity. It wasn't going to go to uh, support stars. One of the other things was at that time, Forrest Tucker was on the scene. F Troop was a show on TV. 
And he had a, a case of liquor brought to his dressing room. And I said that on the air. So they flipped out. They fired everybody they saw that night because <laughs> they didn't know what to do. You know, the upper management people don't know how to handle right. the embarrassment. And uh, I long since have come through a lot of amends with that. You know, I mean, first of all, uh, Frank and I became very good friends, Frank Gorshin and I. And I asked him only about five, he just died, you know, about five or six years ago. He did, he played George Burns on Broadway. And I had him on my show in New York. And I said, why did you not do any impressions? You know, we went over the whole thing. He said, Joey, I'm a visual act. I don't sound like I look unless I look with the sound. He said, Kirk Douglas is not funny if I don't make that face, and you're on radio. Right. So I apologized to him. And that's, what, that's, that's what's behind that wonderful story about nailing my shoes to the door, which was an anger. And, and then I did something really dumb. I, had, I was going out with this go-go girl, and I dragged her on the scene for the telethon in the middle of the night, you know, which no one understood that one. <laughs> And uh, I grabbed all of my clothing and signed autographs on the way out of being fired. It was a glamorous exit. Gentlemen, on behalf of the Buffalo Wait, History wait, wait. Museum, this has been a monumental and historic occasion.